My journey with this research began one day as I was sitting in a circle of young and older Nor Norfolk Island women weaving banana bark for our traditional hats. One of the elders asked the rest of us, what about Dem Wahine on, on our bounty? What about those women on the bounty? <clears throat> it was such an important moment for me. The problem is, both as a descendant and as a researcher, there is a large amount of literature and images depicting the mutineers as the only interesting figures in the bounty story. They are vigorously celebrated with the Polynesian women being credited with little agency. Since the Enlightenment, Wallace and Cook's arrival in Tahiti, Pacific peoples have been, peoples have been portrayed as the noble savage and the dusky damsel, the South Sea maiden. The maiden was central to the perceived utopia of Tahiti and the perception of free love so steadfastly believed in back in Europe. It almost seems inevitable that a mutiny would occur, a mutiny against authority and according to some for love. So yes, the bounty mutiny played a vital role in enhancing the allure and romance of Tahiti. Furthermore, the mystique of Tahiti adorned with a mutiny has remained essentially unchanged over the past 200 years. The women of Tahiti are an essential part of this mystique, yet in regards to the bounty women, it has only served to make them more mysterious than interesting, seductive yet powerless, present yet so quiet they can barely be heard and much less understood. The challenge for me has been to step away from the accepted knowledge base and to look at what those women did, how they lived their lives, what they made and establish those cultural activities and objects as my primary sources. The objects are of course the tupper cloths and with those sources and a careful re-reading of captain's logs and sailor's diaries and most importantly, an awareness of their culture of origin and the contemporary culture of Norfolk and Pitcairn Islands, the women begin to emerge. So I would like to introduce them to you. And I might just say here that it's a really wonderful thing to have their names said here in front of all of these tarpa cloths and also the tarpa cloths that they made um, themselves so they are Mautua, Te Raura, Vahiniatua, Tōuwhaiti, Te Varua, Te Iō, Hupuarei, Whaahotu, Te Atua Hitia, Te Ehutea Tua Onoa, Tina Whanea and Mareva. The traditional bounty narrative with its focus only on the mutineers has made the story a European one with Fletcher Christian and John Adams the heroes not only for you, the interested public or the academic, but also for us as act, um, the descendants. This loud and seemingly real narrative has in part defined our idea of ourselves simply because there was no information on the women. In 1808, when the American Mayhew Folger discovered the little Pitcairn community 18 years after the arrival of the bounty, only John Adams remained with nine women and around 25 children. The narrative would have us believe that Adams, who conveniently shared the name of the American revolutionary, was the saviour of this little settlement, that he alone raised the children and transformed himself from an illiterate mutineer to a holy man who saved the children and the women when he converted them to Christianity. So it's clear we must go beyond the widely accepted narrative to discover anything about the women. To begin, we need to remember that 12 women and a baby girl arrived aboard the Bounty in 1790, along with six Polynesian men and only nine mutineers. The majority of the population was overwhelmingly Polynesian, establishing their new society in a Polynesian space. The plants, the landscape, the fish and the birds would all have been familiar to the Polynesians. They were the ones who were needed most to survive on this new land. Over the following 10 years, all the men except Adams were killed or died of sickness. Their battles amongst themselves and with the women gave few moments of peace. Three women also died, two of them falling to their death whilst gathering eggs from the cliffs and one from disease. It also fell on the shoulders of the women after the men had been murdered one by one 
to continue to raise, educate, clothe and feed the children. The Bounty women were in fact powerful actors in the shaping of the culture that would emerge on Pitcairn. On Pitcairn Island, they played key roles in all areas of society, yet history has not highlighted their accomplishments and history to a large extent has chosen to ignore them. It's not only in the European narrative that the women appear invisible. They were excluded from the Polynesian genealogies because they left Tahiti's shores without trace. However, there are clues along the way and we'll look at their names. So the women were known by their Polynesian names and also the names given them by their mutineer husbands after a mother or a sister, for example. Their Polynesian names indicate that at least 10 of the 12 women were of noble classes. Four of the names contain Atua, the Tahitian name for God or gods, indicating that they were royalty or at least from the elite classes of the old Tahitian culture. Two of their names reference, reference goddesses, Fa'ahotu and Vahiniatua. One references Tina, the chiefly family name from Tupue, another Ra'i, the sacred sky, and another the sacred colour, red uru, ura. This disproves the often quoted premise by the linguists and would-be historians, Ross and Moverley, that the majority of the women were nondescripts of the lower classes. Their presence is felt day to day in the lives of their descendants on Pitcairn and Norfolk Islands. Polynesian words are sprinkled throughout the Norfolk and Pitcairn language, serving as a constant reminder to the, that these women educated their children in their own language. Also that their cooking methods and weaving techniques are still a large part of um, our island living. The women made vast amounts of tapa, some of which were gifted to visiting captains and crews from the time of Folger's visit in 1808. And fortunately, many of these have ended up in museums around the world. These tapa are important as primary sources for a number of reasons. In certain cases, the woman who gifted the tupper was noted, and in others, the collector was noted. Furthermore, occasionally, these exchanges between ship's crews and the women are mentioned in journals and diaries. And lastly, the quality of the tupper cloth reveals the background of the maker. As a researcher, putting this data together provides me with a large amount of information. And as, and as a descendant of these women, there are no words to describe the experience of touching the tupper cloth made and used by an ancestor, something she touched and laboured labored over. <coughs> Another thing to know is that the first six women on this list of names had children and the last six died childless. Of the five pieces on display here at the exhibition, we know that Moatua Tera Ura and little Peggy Stewart made the cue pieces that are in the, down in the back of the hall and the daughter of Vahinia Tua gifted and therefore was probably the maker of the Aberdeen Tiputa. At Kew Gardens there are three pieces of cloth connected to the bounty story. They contain some clues to the upbringing of the makers, their personalities and friendships and the developing culture of Pitcairn at the time. All three were donated to Kew by Frances Haywood, Peter Haywood's widow. The first I would like to talk about is one made by Moatua. Fletcher Christian named her Isabella after his cousin and mainmast because of her height. Uh, this is a fragment cut from a lar larger piece, plain white and incredibly fine, exhibiting great skill. These techniques were used by the upper classes in old Tahiti. The Reverend Thomas Murray wrote that Francis Haywood had given him a piece of beautifully wrought white tupper cut from a larger bale that Moatua had sent via Captain Jenkin Jones in 1841. The captain surgeon, William Gunn, described an outbreak of influenza on the island and mentioned the only two old persons on the island who were Moatua and Te Ura. From the time the bounty had arrived in Tahiti to collect breadfruit, Moatua appears to have been associated with the crew, travelling with them to Tupuwe after the mutiny whilst Haywood was still on board. Christian and Haywood were 
were close friends and this must have impressed Moatur enough to extend this friendship to Haywood's wife. According to Frances's daughter, before being cut up, this cloth measured several yards and she described it as beautifully manufactured tupper cloth. Certainly it, it appears the gift was treasured by both Frances and her daughter. The museum tag accompanying the piece tells us the cloth was collected in 1842, although it was 1841, and that Moatua was 100 years old, <coughs> which may or may not be true. She was noted in the Pitcairn Register uh, as remembering Captain Cook's first visit to Tahiti. She must have been allowed to come very close to Cook as she was able to describe details of his rheumatism and the Tahitian massage and the medicine that was given to him. This is further testimony of her position in society as she was allowed to approach and observe a man of Cook's standing. Moatua died only a month after Jones's visit to the island, succumbing to the influenza. More pieces of Moatua's work can be found and there are three more samples at the British Museum. The tags reveal interesting information. Often the women were referred to by the, sur to by the surname of their original partner on Pitcan, even if he had died and she'd moved on. Before arriving on Pitcan, John Adams maintained that the mutineers married nine of the 12 women while still aboard the bounty, probably as a way to claim ownership over them, as there were more men than women in the <coughs> early days. Fletcher Christian was killed in 1793 and Moatua consequently settled with, Ed, with Edward Young and had another three or four children. But she always remained Mrs Christian. Tera Ura, who arrived at Pitcairn as Mrs Young, went on to settle down with Moatua and Christian's son, Thursday October Christian, and there's actually a drawing of him down the back. Yet he was still known to, she was still known as, to visitors as Mrs Young. Moatua and Tera Ura were the oldest and youngest women to arrive on Pitcairn in 1790. They outlived all the other original settlers. They worked together making fine white tupper cloth. In 1833, after a visit, Frederick Bennett wrote briefly about them, describing Moatua as active, both mentally and physically. Tera Ura appears to have taken a shine into the young Bennett, giving a lock of her long and dark curly hair as a gift along with a native cloth of British, <coughs> excuse me, of brilliant colours which she had herself manufactured, end of quote. So now we know that Tera Ura made both plain and coloured cloth. I hope that's in focus, yeah. The story of Peggy, George Stewart and their daughter Charlotte known more often as Little Peggy, is a fascinating tale. Peggy and George were married in a traditional ceremony in Tahiti before the mutiny. She was the daughter of, a great, of the great chief Tipo of Titha, today known as Fa'a'a, where the airport is, who also had, an extent, who also had extensive contacts and influence over Pare, Mahina and Matavai, which is where the bounty was. His sister was known was the woman known to Wallace as the Queen of Tahiti or Purea. She is the only one I can definitely place in the genealogical charts because Charlotte or little Peggy stayed in Tahiti. No one writes more beautifully of Peggy and her fate than the miss missionaries who arrived in 1797 aboard the Duff. And I quote, the history of Peggy Stewart marks a tenderness of heart that never will be heard without emotion. She was the daughter of a chief and taken for his, for his wife by Mr. Stewart, one of the unhappy mutineers. They had lived with the old chief in the most tender state of endearment. A beautiful little girl had been the fruit of their union and was at the breast when the Pandora arrived, seized the criminals and secured them in irons on board the ship. Frantic with grief, the unhappy Peggy, for so he had named her, flew with her infant in a canoe to the arms of her husband the interview was so affecting and afflicting that the officers on board were overwhelmed with anguish and Stuart himself, unable to bear the heart-rending scene, begged she might not be admitted again on board. 
she was separated from him by violence and conveyed on shore in a state of despair and grief too big for utterance. Withheld from him and forbidden to come any more on board, she sunk into the deepest dejection." End of quote. Little Peggy grew up with the missionaries after her mother died, it is said, of a broken heart. At some stage, little Peggy made a fine tapa out of Aote and gifted it to Lieutenant John Marshall of the Royal Navy, who later presented it, presented it to Peter Haywood or Peter's widow. We, we must remember that Peter Haywood and George Stewart were the closest of friends. The Vahinia Tua's daughter, Dinah, gifted the beautiful tiputa which is on display. This one is very special as it shows signs of having been worn and repaired. The tiputa is made out of a number of layers of cloth, made from the paper mulberry called aute, the breadfruit called uru, and possibly the banyan which is called ora. They are strengthened with the pasted red stripes over the shoulders and are carefully lined. The assembly of patterned and dyed cloth is repeated in several tiputa, most of which are held in the British Museum and the National Museum of Scotland. And thanks to the symposium this past week, another one has been located by uh, Michaela Apple of the Munich Museum of Ethnology. So it's very, very exciting for me. Have to make sure it's real. There are also several examples of patterned and layered tapa not yet cut for tiputa, perhaps meant to be used as blankets or mats. The particular stamped patterns and pasting of rows of straight or zigzag lines in this way is unique to Pitcairn. Remember that we know that Terra Uda made brightly coloured cloth, as did it as Piers Dina, Vahinia to his daughter. Perhaps this was an experiment involving both generations. Both men and women wore the patterned fabric. fabric. Dinah's sister Hannah is here with her husband George Young. And here they're depicted preparing an hima'a or earth oven, wearing a fairly short tiputa, unlike the longer ones in Tahiti, and also wearing a dark red pario, which is like a sarong. Frederick Bennett described Polly Young as the finest and most intelligent woman on the island in 1833. Polly and her sister Dolly were both daughters of Moatua and Edward Young, and unlike her, they made and like her, sorry, they made beautiful plain cloth. It makes sense that the mother would pass on her skills to her daughters. Polly's piece is held at the Turnbull Library in Wellington, New Zealand, and Dolly's piece is held at the Pitt River Museum in Oxford. However, the majority of Pitt Kern Island top cloths do not have a known maker. Sometimes just the writing on the cloth or a tag gives some information. Certainly, there are three main groups of tapa cloth, the very fine white cloth, the pattern pieces, and the thicker pieces, which appear to have been made by the later generations, when perhaps the technique was not as exacting. This piece from the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Cambridge simply states that it was made by the Pitcairn Islanders and has very little accompanying information. At the British Museum, there are another two pieces of tapa which show great skill and knowledge. These are very rare specimens. This piece was possibly made by Hannah, Vahinia Tua's daughter and Dinah's sister. And it would have been made as an ahufara, which is like a shawl to be worn over the shoulders to protect you from the sun. By 1850, Tera Ura died. She was the last of the original settlers. Six years later, the entire Pitcairn population was moved to Norfolk Island, one of the last activities the women were seen involved in before leaving Pitcairn was making tapa. However, that would end 
on reaching Norfolk Island where the flora and climate are different. Tupper would not have been warm enough for the pit kerners on Norfolk. And furthermore, <coughs> active missionaries began to train the women on how to run their lives in an English fashion with a ready supply of cotton. On Norfolk, cloth was still gifted to, to visitors, but it, was, but it was tupper made on Pitcairn. This tag is as important as the tupper cloth it accompanies, showing us that it was now the second generation of women giving, gifting cloth. On the return of some of the families to Pitcairn years later, some of the women resumed making tupper, but the practice stopped again in the 1840s. Fortunately, this practice is being revived while the Pitcairn Tapa are becoming better known and understood. The Yahoo Sisters are a group of women descendants who initially formed in order to protect the Tapa images from being reproduced in a commercial venture of little benefit to the descendants of the makers. But since then, we've achieved much. Meralda Warren has developed her own successful practice and is now passing on her knowledge to the children on Pitcairn Island. Her deep cultural knowledge and passion for growing ote in her gardens and making tapa has been a true inspiration. With trial and error, she has revived the art of dyeing and decorating cloth. Jean Clarkson was the first to discover the existence and importance of the Pitcairn tapa cloths when she opened Simon Kui, Kuiman's Tapa in Polynesia book. Her art practice has blossomed with the knowledge of this practice and has begun making tupper with her daughter in New Zealand. Similarly, Sue Pearson is a prolific artist who has been exhibited internationally and is well recognised for her work around the tupper and the Bounty women. These artists continue to celebrate the accomplishments of our foremothers through their artwork and, exhibition, and exhibitions which have been held in Tahiti, Norfolk Island, New Zealand but I think the most important one was held recently on Pitcairn Island, as you can see in the photo. Meralda and the ch school children put their work on display at the school to raise awareness of their cultural heritage. I feel it's important to never again forget the legacy of these women who by love or kidnapping end up, ended up far from their homelands and began a new culture and society. So in closing, the women on Pitcairn actively contributed to the identity of the island, defining themselves and their children each time they produced a bale of tupper using the techniques and knowledge of their cultural and social background. This was affirmed each time they honoured the age-old ritual of gifting tupper, and each time they passed their knowledge onto their own daughters and granddaughters, and each time they clothed themselves in tupper. Finally, by presenting the Pitcairn Tupper here at this exhibition and in this context of Pacificness, the pieces are validated as contributing to the Pacific story. I'd like to thank the organisers of the symposium and the exhibition for asking me to participate and talk with you today. It's such an honour. I'd also like to thank all those wonderful curators over the years. Hopefully some of them are here. <laughs> and. Um, who have been so generous with their time in allowing me to access the cloths and the collection catalogues because museum people are really very special people. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.